word from the Apostle Paul today. Paul was a world changer and there was a reason. He knew, he knew God differently than, than many do. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul writes to his spiritual son. They have been on a journey together for many, many years. It started in Lystra in Acts chapter 14. Timothy lived in Lystra. And Paul went there on one of his journeys and he preached the word. And, and the religious leaders there in, in Lystra and government leaders as well, they didn't like it. And they grabbed rocks and they stoned Paul to death and drug him out the gates of the city. But there were disciples in Lystra and a part of those disciples was Timothy's family. His grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice were a part of those disciples. And Barnabas was on, he was on the journey with Paul and they went outside of those gates and they stood around him and prayed and he rose from the dead. Timothy was one of those that saw this. Paul had earlier laid his hands on this young man and prayed that the gifts of the Holy Spirit would come to life in him, and they had. And it was that day that Timothy determined that he would, that he would travel with the Apostle Paul. He would be an apprentice with him, and Paul would teach him to preach, and he did preach in Thessalonica and in Philippi and in various places, Berea, and he actually even took over in Ephesus. Paul writes to his spiritual son, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. 2 Timothy 1.12, New Living Translation, Paul says, I'm suffering here in prison, but I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day he returns. Paul says, I know him, I know him. I know him personally. Some believe that the word know should have been translated as friend or companion because he didn't just know him in a casual way. He was a companion with, with God, with Christ. He was a friend with him. Sometimes I'm asked, do you know someone? And that will depend uh, um, on who they are, of course, but on how well I know them. I might know them, I've met them. But if that's the thing, I'd say, well, I know them, but I don't know them very well. That's not what's being said here. Paul says, I know him. I know him well. He's my friend. I know him. He's my companion. I, I know him. Message Bible. My stand for Christ is the cause of all this trouble I'm in, but I have no regrets. I couldn't be more sure of my ground. The one I've trusted in can take care of what he trusted me to do right to the end. No regrets. I trust him. No regrets because I know him. I know him as Savior, yes, but it's beyond that. I know him as friend. I know him as companion. There was a difference. That difference made the difference between someone who knew him as Savior. And that difference of knowing him as Savior and now knowing him as friend and knowing him as companion was the difference of him being a world changer. Second Timothy is thought to be the last letter that Paul ever wrote, at least in the New Testament canon of Scripture. He writes from a prison cell 
in Rome. He has been convicted as a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. He has actually been described as a pestilent fellow. Acts 24, 5, they describe him as a pestilent fellow. No matter the punishment, no matter if it was stoning, beatings, beating with rods, no matter what they did, put, imprison him, he just kept declaring what God says. And so to the Pharisees, to the government leader, and now to Rome, he was a pest. Seems to me like the, the world could use a few pestilent fellows. I'm ascribing, or as, <laughs> I'm aspiring to be one myself. Maybe we ought to have an, a pest conference. All the pests come. Paul knows his life on earth is about over. Not because of some terminal condition, but because he has been sentenced to die. And indeed, a, a few years, or less than a year later, he was beheaded by Nero in Rome. But Paul, he's not melancholy, he's not, he's not down about it. No, he shows us the character of a man who has pursued God for year after year, decade after decade. He shows us the character of a man whose faith has matured. He has matured well, his faith has matured well. You, you can tell if you're around someone whose faith has matured well. They're just solid. It shows. Love for people and love for God has matured. It shows in his actions. Disciplines are now matured. He doesn't have to remind himself every day to pray to read his Bible, to praise his God, to give thanks. No, they are disciplined ways that are just his nature. Trust has matured. He's gone through so many battles he can't remember them all, and God's come through every time, so he, his trust is matured. Tenacious conviction has matured. He's not wishy-washy. Profound insights have now matured. Life insights, ways of God, doctrines, they are matured. And relationship with God has now matured. It's not surface. It, his communion with God is not shallow. It has a depth to it proven by years of examples. He has, he has kept his Christian life in a growing relationship way, growing. He's kept it growing. Paul says somewhat, somewhat truthfully yet without arrogance, no arrogance, I know him. I know him well. He's my companion. He's a friend. That, in fact, was his quest in life. That was his life mission. He tells us that. That was his goal. He told the Philippians in three, chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, years before this, that his quest was knowing Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. In other words, my fellowship with him will include even times when it's difficult. I won't back down. Going so far as to say anything else in comparison to me is rubbish. It's trash. Fellowship with King Jesus was a priority. Companionship with, with Christ was a priority. Not enough think that way today. Many just seek him as Savior and that's it. Companionship with him or friendship with him is not really sought in so many. The tone of this letter is different than other letters in the New Testament. And you can tell that there is something that is weighing on Paul's mind and he's trying to convey the importance of standing up 
for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the urgency of standing strong in perilous times, in very difficult times, the importance of clearly distinguishing the difference between right and wrong and saying so, between truth and error and saying so, between good and evil and saying so, the necessity of standing in faith as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, of warring a good warfare, he says. So some warfare must be good, of fighting the good fight with a pure conscience. So some fights are good. Some fights are righteous. Some fights must be fought. Of being an example of the believers, of confronting teachers who compromise what God says with passivity, with unbelief, or fear. Also, he stresses the, invital, the vital importance of accepting responsibility for continuously growing up in Christ. In other words, you've got to keep growing. You, you can't stop. You've got to keep on going. Grow closer. Grow closer to him. And there is no doubt he is conveying the his own insatiable quest to know Christ and within his words is a challenge to Timothy and a challenge to millions of others down through history to do the same. If there was one key to success in every area of life I could give to anyone, it's to grow closer to him. Make it your quest to know him. Get to know him more and more and more, closer and closer, press in to know him, not, not just about him, not just the study about him, him, not just a corporate God, a corporate God of the world, no, personal, personal, not a casual observer, no, a committed, a committed disciple. The world today is in desperate need of committed disciples. It is in desperate need of people who know him in the power of his resurrection. It was 1976. I was working at a concrete company thinking about, I'd begin to think about going to Bible school 48 years ago. Christian TV was just getting started back then. And CBN, well, it was just Pat Robertson's television network, they were going to televise the Full Gospel Businessmen's Convention in California. I had never seen a Christian, um, a, a Christian convention in a big arena before. Back then, it was unheard of. I had never seen anything like that, and, and I, I wanted to see it. Well, it, being in California, naturally, it was going to come on really late at night, but I, I just had to see it because Oral Roberts was going to be the preacher, and I, I, I had to see it. So I stay up late, and, and I'm watching this. And when he began to preach... Something supernatural happened. And it's easy to explain, and yet it's, it was so life-changing. Something supernatural happened as I began to hear him preach, a mantle to preach, an anointing to preach came upon me. And I could feel it. I could feel a mantle. It was, it was wrapped around my shoulders like a cocoon or like a, a blanket. An anointing to preach came around me like it wrapped me, and I felt it. It wasn't just something that I heard. I actually physically felt this. 
And I had recently been to another full gospel businessmen's meeting. It was a regional meeting with T.L. Osborne was the speaker. And he had talked about being called of God to, to preach. And he just said, I don't know if I, I don't know what a calling is. He said, I just figured that I could do what I could. And that I was going to just work for God that way. I'll just do what I could. I thought, I can do that. I can do what I could. And now I feel this mantle. It wraps around me. I felt it. And it was the first time that I ever had an inkling that I could know him. It was the first time that I had an inkling that I could actually walk with God. I could be a disciple like the early disciples. I could actually be a companion of God. This was revolutionary to me. I mean, I can know him different. I'll never forget it. He, Oral Roberts, began preaching about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And suddenly the fourth man appeared in the fire with him, and his appearance was like the Son of God. And Oral then asked the question, who is this fourth man? And he began to declare who Jesus is in the volumes of God's book, the Holy Bible. And I remember standing to my feet in the living room. I couldn't help it. I jumped up. I had never heard that before. Never. It was a rhema word to me. It was a, a, an alive word. And I remember thinking, he wants us to know him. Different than I ever have. He, he doesn't want to be distanced. Distant. I didn't, I didn't know that. I was raised in church. I didn't know that. I, I knew him as Savior. I didn't know him any other way. I didn't even know I could. All we did was talk about salvation. We'd stop the, 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 the hymns to give an altar call, then give another one. You get three or four at a time because we were all going to hell every week. And I, that's all I knew. He's my Savior. And I remember the awareness came. He wants more than that. And it was like I could hear God's voice inside of me revealing who my Savior friend was or is through the volumes of the book. I stood in rapt attention as a mantle wrapped around my shoulders that I could feel hearing for the first time in Genesis. He's the seed of the woman who has come to stomp the head of the serpent for you. In Exodus, he's your Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's your high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet greater than Moses coming to deliver you and take you into promised places. In Joshua, he is the captain of your salvation. And he went all through all 66 volumes of God's book declaring who Jesus is in every single one of them. I had never heard anything like that ever before. And I knew I was, in being, I was being invited to know him. I was being invited to personally walk with him. I, I, I knew I was being invited to know him as a supernatural person. A supernatural person. It was his desire for me. And I knew it was his desire for every man, woman, boy and girl, for everybody. That was his desire. His desire was for, for me to walk with him and begin to pick up and discern his heart. 
Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7 a quote from Jesus himself concerning himself. He said, I've come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the volumes of your book. And over the next few weeks, I determined I would pursue knowing who, who Christ really is. I would pursue knowing him in every volume of the word of God, of the books. It was an invitation that I would accept and I would spend my life telling others about. You should accept this invitation along with salvation. That pursuit has taken me on a, an incredible odyssey of purpose, yes. But it has taken me through the volumes of the book. Time after time after time after time after time, thousands of hours, I want to know him. I, I, it's, it's, it's my desire to know him. I want to, I want to know him more than an acquaintance. I want him to know him more than just a savior. And that I can staggers my mind, really. I mean, think about that. I can know God. You, you can know God. You can know him. I can know Jesus. You can know Jesus. You can know him. You can do that. I can know Holy Spirit. You can know Holy Spirit. I can know the unique blended oneness of the Godhead. I can know it. I can know the blended unity of the omniscient one, the all-knowing one. I, I can know the, the blended unity of the omnipresent one. He's everywhere. He's never, he, he's always with me. I can know the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one. That's astounding. That's incredible. What a privilege. What a benefit. What an invitation. The volumes of the book reveal two very important things to know about God. Everyone should know them. They are amazing to ponder. They are insightful. And they tell us something about him that we ought to know. From the very beginning, the Bible teaches that God wanted two things. He wanted a family. And he wanted Friends, If you're going to understand the Godhead, you've got to understand that. He wanted a family. He wanted friends. It was so important that Jesus would be willing to lay down his life on a cross for it to happen. Now think about this just a moment. Don't just hurry past this. It will tell you something about him. Him. The personal him. The one who is, is love. The zenith of love. The one who is love had no family. The one who had the greatest father's heart has no kids. The one who is love has no friends. I mean, who was, God, who was God's friend before he made the earth? Who did the timeless one spend his time with? Who did the, the joyful one enjoy life with? When he wanted to take a day off, where'd he go? And with whom? Angels? I don't think so. Be, because, yes, angels were always around, but I don't think so because angels were, they're, they are cause, they are cause created. They, they are created to fill a need. There's a cause for them to serve. They were not made in the image and likeness 
of God like we are. That's informative. It's not that God was lonely. You can't say it that way. You must say it that he had a longing. And that's the best description from the Hebrew language that I can get or the Greek text really. It, he, had, he had a longing. Because real love seeks expression. It always does. Again, that's informative. God has longings. King Jesus has desires. Informative. And two of the top expressions of real love involve family and friends. The fact that God wanted family is seen in his description of heaven itself. Think of how he described it. He describes it as home. It's the eternal home of Father God and his family. It's the home of, of his sons and his daughters. It's our home. That's informative. He must want us home. He wants us to be in his home. To this day, we, we describe the death of someone who, who is a believer. We often describe it as their home going. They went home. God wanted friends and he wanted family. Well, in the Old Testament, we find that God had very few friends. They were very rare. Obviously, New Testament relationship was not available yet. And you find very few friends of God. We are told of Enoch. Enoch was God's friend. Enoch walked in companionship with the Lord so close that one day when God went to do whatever he was doing, Enoch just went with him. God took him. He walked so close to God. He was walking. It says Enoch walked with God. That's informative. And it speaks of companionship or friendship. It's something that we have to grow up in in our maturity. I don't think we start there. I didn't. Um, oh, a couple of months ago, I, uh, this past year, most of you know, I went through some physical things and, and uh, I, had to, I had to take care of some things that uh, had happened and, and uh, it took four or five months for me to get through that. And I, I had not gone to the lake where I like to go and pray for probably five months. I just couldn't do that. And uh, I remember um, Dutch and Chuck Pierce were coming for a hub and, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm gonna go out and, and I'm gonna talk to the Lord at where I like to pray out to the lake. And uh, I thought, I'm gonna do that. And uh, just press in. And so I get good. At, I get out there and I take the truck because it hadn't been used in four months or so. And I pull out there and I get out and I said, Lord, what are we going to do? What's this about? What do you want me to do? And then I just was quiet and I started walking and walking and walking. I walked all those places I like out there. And probably a few hours later, when I got back to the truck, I realized I hadn't said anything else. It wasn't like I was praying, oh God. I wasn't even praying in other tongues. And yet, the whole time I was in communion, our hearts were talking. I was hearing him. I knew him. I, I was receiving ideas. Things were penetrating inside of my, my inner being. I realized I'd been walking with him. And I'd entered into a zone that I wasn't even thinking. I was just present with him. 
He wants us to learn to do that. Life goes on. You do this or that, but you're, you're walking. You're walking with him. He's there. It's a companionship with a personal spirit, supernatural spirit being. Well, Enoch did that, and he must have did it better than me because I'm still here. But he, he's a friend. Companionship mattered. Well, there's Abraham. The scripture tells us that Abraham and God were friends, but you wouldn't get that from Abraham, really. He's not the one that tells us that we're friends. God said that. God said, me and Abraham are friends. Think about that. Isn't that telling? I mean, that's so informative. God must pay attention to who, who his friends are, who's a companion with him, because he clearly says, Abraham is my friend. God told Abraham things he told no one else on the planet at that, in those days, at that time. He even let his friend Abraham know that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of its perversion. And why did he do that? Because he knew Abraham had family who lived there. And he knew, he said, I know Abraham. I know what he's going to do. He's going to intercede for his family. And I want him to because I don't want to destroy the righteous with the wicked. I don't want to do that. And so I'm going to talk to him about it. I'm going to tell him what, we're, what our plan is because he'll intercede. I know he will. And when he tells him, what does Abraham do? He says to, to Father God, he says, well, you won't destroy the righteous with the wicked. I know you won't. That'd be far from you to do that. And the the idea was God wanted him to intercede because I've given the earth to you. The heavens I'll take care of, but you have authority. What happens here will be because you ask, because you decree, because of your faith. And if you'll do that, then I can intercede. I don't want to destroy the righteous with the wicked. So I'm going to talk to Abraham. And, and Abraham did intercede. Judgment Hear this. It is so informative to me anyway. Judgment was avoided for family members because Abraham and God were friends. Amazingly, your friendship with God can bless your entire family. Informative. God and Abraham were close, so close, God confided in him a plan of the Godhead. Well, I want to know him that way. I, 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 I want to be known as his friends or his friend. A friend tells friends, they tell them things that they don't tell just everybody. They'll tell a friend something that they don't tell anybody else. I want to pursue a life, live su in such a way that God would tell me things that he will only tell friend. And then there's Moses. Moses and God became best friends. That is so informative. Evidently, you don't have to be perfect to be God's friend. You could be a murderer that's repented. I mean, Moses killed a guy, went into exile, hiding in a mountain for 40 years, and yet the Word of God says they become best friends. In fact, God said this concerning Moses. I'll speak to others in visions and dreams, but me and Moses are different. We will speak face to face like friends. Numbers 12, verse 8. We're friends so, so close that he, God says he knows my ways. We're, 
we're such companions, we're so close that he, he, he knows how I'm thinking. He, he understands my nature, he understands my ways. So close that, and this is mind blowing to me, so close God did Moses' funeral. Also, God buried Moses himself while a seraphim, Michael, the archangel, God buried Moses while a seraph, Michael, told Lucifer, back off. You have no part of this. The Lord rebukes you. According to the apostle Jude, that's what he said. So close. So it is, it is possible to get pretty close. God wanted family and he wanted friends. But, but they had to have a free will. Had to. You can't make someone be your friend. You can be friendly. You could cultivate friendship. But it's someone's choice as to whether or not they're going to be your friend. God wanted free choice family. And he wanted free choice friends. He, he wanted free choice companions. And he was willing to go to great lengths to make it possible. Jesus would lay down his own life for it. Saying in John 14 and verse 13 to his disciples, there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. You are my friends. You're my companions. I don't call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in slaves. You're my friends. I've told you everything the Father's told me. You didn't choose me first. I chose you. And appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. And as you do, know the Father will go, or the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Jesus gave his life so whoever, whoever wants to, can be a part of his family. That's number one, yes. That's, that's number one for certain, but it's just the beginning of so much more. Also something else that shouts with love and acceptance is revealed because of the cross. Kinship can become friendship. Kinship becomes friendship. Keep growing. Keep pursuing. I can know Jesus as Savior, as Lord, as as master, as redeemer, and I do, but I can also know him as friend, and I am determined to know him in all of those ways, more and more and more. I want to grow in my understanding of who he is. I want to grow closer and closer and closer. I want to understand him more. I want to draw close to him. I want to know him as my God friend. Obviously, the more you fellowship with, with someone, the better you know them. The more fellowship, the more you understand them. The closer the fellowship or the more companionship, the more you understand their nature. The more you understand their ways, the more you understand uh, their, their character. What makes them them? I sometimes hear people say things about God. Well, God's this, God's that, God's that. And I'm thinking inside, no, he's not. I know him. He didn't do that. That's not him at all. He doesn't do that. Never will. Why? Because you, 
You press in to know his character, know his ways. You got to know his character. You're going to walk with him. You got to understand his ways, his nature, his character. Why he does what he does. His word will always tell you. His word will define it. The more you fellowship, the more you understand. The more communion, the deeper the relationship. And thankfully, where our relationship with Christ is concerned, we are continually invited to know him more. Draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to us. And no matter what your spiritual level of maturity may be, there's always more. There's always no, more. You can always go deeper in the things of God. We will never mine out all that he is. That's the odyssey of the Christian life. That's the journey that, that we're on. That's what excites me. Our, the Christian maturity process is growing to know him more. Growing to understand him. How he's thinking. What he wants. Desires that he may have. His ways. I've been on that journey quite a while now. And it's a journey that never ends. It's a journey that's always fresh. You hear some people say, well, that Christianity, that Christian life, that's got to be a boring way to live. You don't know him. It's never, it's anything but boring. We've got to get past it. just, well, he's my savior. Thankfully, I'm not going to hell. Yes, number one, Yes. But you can walk with God. You can understand Him. See, I was raised. He's un you can't understand Him. And, of course, His ways are past finding out. Well, I agree. We'll never, in this life, find them all out. But let's find some of them. And some of them are pretty easy. He wants friends. He wants companions. He wants family. Paul says, I know the one I trust. I know the one my confidence is in. I do know that. I know the one I trust. I trust him. And I am sure he is able to keep what I've put in his hands until the day he comes for me. How do I know that? Because I know him. I know he's faithful. I know he comes through. I know he delivers. I know he turns things for good. It may take a while. He may have to change parts of the earth to get it done. He may have to change things in my life around to get it done. But he'll turn it for good. I know he will. He has my back. I know he has my back. There's been so many times when I knew he's got my back. I know he does. I know him. As we end this Thanksgiving week, we see more truth that we, be, we should be so thankful for. God doesn't want to be distant. Our King Jesus, the magnificent, powerful, almighty one, doesn't want to be distant from you. He wants to be close. A very present help in time of trouble. A very present Savior King. A Savior King friend who keeps his word. The all-powerful one there with us. What a blessing. Just before the cross, Jesus sat down with his friends, his disciples. And he sat down to eat the Passover meal with them. And that night he changed 
hundreds of years of tradition of the traditional meal to portray what we call what he would do for us and what we call communion. He changed it to portray what his blood would do for us, his shed blood would do for us on the cross for our sins. To portray his body would be broken for our healing and included entirety of our being. Our spiritual healing, yes, but didn't stop there. Soulish healing, healing for our mind, healing for our emotions, physical healing for our bodies. Isaiah the prophet said it this way, Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 amplified. Surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses. And he has carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And with the stripes that, that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. So many things there. Spiritual healing, physical healing, emotional, mental healing, even sorrow. Surely he carried your sorrows. You don't have to live sorrowfully. He carried it. The amazing thing, as I thought about this this week, is Jesus sat with them for this Passover meal. What we now call the communion meal. He wasn't distant. He wasn't like, hey, I've got a lot on my plate this weekend. No, he came to the meal and sat down. He wasn't distant. He was there. He sat there with them. Why? It was personal. It was about companionship. Please know today, as we approach the communion table, Jesus is not distant today. He's not distant. He comes to this communion table. He is here. The omnipresent one is here. The all-powerful, all-knowing one is here. He's attending. Our Savior is here. Our Deliverer is here. Our Healer is here. Our Friend is here. The ever-faithful Companion is here. And He said, as oft as you do this, please know, I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Faithfully ministering my covenant, represented in the bread and in the wine, ministering it to my family and to my friends. Singers and musicians, come please. So we come to the table of the Lord. What a promise that he made. And he never lies. When you come to the table, I'm coming to the table. When you come to the table, I'm coming to the table. I'll be there. I don't know what you may need today. I just know that the one that can take care of it all is coming to the table. I don't know what kind of healing you need today, but I know the one that can heal you is coming to the table. Maybe you came in carrying sorrow. You're carrying sorrow. Leave it at the table. Give it to your God King friend. You don't have to be here to do that. You could be sitting in your living room wherever you are. You can be overseas, and many of you probably are watching right now or will. He carried it. He says, okay, get, get the bread and get, get the wine. 
come to the table. I'm coming to the table. Hand me your sorrow. Hand me your pain. Whatever you need. And beyond that, know that when, when you get up from the table, know that my desire is to be your companion, to walk with you, be your friend. I'm your God friend. I'm your God savior friend. So we come to the table of the Lord, the table of the Lord. It's only possible through him. He didn't have to do it, but he did. When you come to the table, I'm going to sit down with you. Ushers, if you will, come to your stations. Lord, we pray that you would sanctify these elements to begin to represent in a full picture, as full as we can, Lord, what you did, why you did it. To welcome us to a walk with you, to welcome us into salvation if we need it and a relationship beyond that. I pray, God, that today those who do not know you as Savior will now become those who ask you into their lives. Save them. Save those that are crying out today. Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. I need you. Forgive me of my sins. And beyond that, Lord, I pray that for those that have received you as their savior, that kinship will become friendship. Kinship become friendship. May we understand that and draw into your presence today around your table. Jesus took the bread And he said, this is my body broken for you. Healing is available. It's covenant. And as we partake of the bread today, do so understanding that covenant is yours. Life can flow today. Life of God flows. Covenant becomes real. He's here. He's here to heal took the stripes on his back for you, took the punishment of the pain for you. So let's partake of the bread together, please, and do so in remembrance of him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We honor you, King Jesus. Faithful minister of the covenant. Thank you. Then he took the cup and said, now this is going to represent a new covenant. The old one's passing away. It's a new covenant that I'm going to make through my shed blood. And all your sins will be canceled. Every past failure, all that, no regrets, it's gonna hang on. You're gonna be clean, you're gonna be new. Because this covenant is made with my sinless body. It's broken for you and it bleeds to establish a new covenant so that you can be forever free 
forever free. Perhaps today you've got some things you say in my life, my conscience, my things bothering me. He's here today. The covenant is strong. Partake and know he's wiping the slate clean for you. You're free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So partake today with me and let's believe that covenant is active this morning in this room. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your cleansing. Thank you, Lord. Relationship restored. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the invitation to walk with you. Yes, as our Savior, but beyond that. We love you, Lord. As Paul, after years, decades, starts in a last book, I am not ashamed. We are unashamed. We know who we have believed and are persuaded. He's able. He's able. He's able to take care of us. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for a Thanksgiving week. We thank you that it has been a time of refreshing, but beyond just family and friends with you as well at family tables around our nation, but at your table in your house. What a privilege. Be with your people this week, Lord. We know that you will walk with them through their job situations, life situations, family situations. And we will give you all praise and glory. Amen. Amen. All right, bless you. Have a great rest of your day.